lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How about you? Pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. This is the, the eve of our departure. Yes. Uh, yeah. I still got to pack. Yeah. I haven't packed anything. Well, I haven't packed anything either, but it took the whole day off tomorrow, so. I didn't. I have to work tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll get up early and and oh. pack stuff. Nope, I, I got to pack. It'll be easy enough. It's only a couple of days. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the weather's supposed to be essentially the weather here. That's good. It's like pretty cool at night, like upper 50s and 70s in the day. Yeah. Which is a little warmer than I'd like, but, you know, how well. So do you know who's going to be speaking? I have no idea. Me either. I was hoping you knew. I need to look. No. Um, and <laughs> sweet. Okay. So the, yeah, the, the LPA at least put up a, um, a, like, I don't know, schedule, I guess. Yeah. Uh, should probably look at that too. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it'll be in your little packet that you get when you arrive or anyway. Yeah. But, uh, wh- what I was going to say is that the, um, the national convention, so I, I looked up the national convention cause um, it's in just a few months and I need to start arranging flights and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And of course, you know, buying my tickets and it's a typical libertarian thing where, you know, you, there's a million levels because, uh, any extra stuff that you want to be involved in, you pay for You got to pay for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, which is cool. It gives you a whole lot of options so you can opt into the things that you want and opt out of the things that you don't want. And you only pay for the things that you want. All right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, but they didn't have any dis- description of what was in each of the packages. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so there's just a whole bunch of these, like, cutely named packages, but I don't know what I get out of any of them. So I couldn't, <laughs> I was like, I can't, and I hunted around to try and find some kind of description of this so that I knew what I was paying for. Yeah. But I couldn't find anything. Oh, did you just pick the one with the cutest name? No, I picked not picking anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I, I'll have to figure it out later. I'm hoping maybe that information goes up later, or maybe I was just looking in the wrong place. I'm hoping that this weekend I will be able to talk to somebody who might be able to answer yeah. that question. Interesting. You know, um, somebody that's more involved at the national level that might be able to say, oh, yeah, you you just need to go to this other website for some reason. <laughs> no, they'll just tell you, this is the package you need to take. <laughs> I, I don't accept that kind of <laughs> you wouldn't, you know, that, that wouldn't be no, acceptable I, to yeah, you. <laughs> no, I want to know what's in everything. And make my own decision. I'm, I'm into making my own decisions. It's part of the reason this, I'm a libertarian. <laughs> this is very independent of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, well, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Uh, woke up to interesting news this morning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What was that? The Russia invades Ukraine. Oh. Yeah. So did that happen today? See, I, th- I thought it had happened yesterday. Well, I mean, I maybe guess... it was like a soft invasion yesterday and today is the full scale. Um, yesterday it was they were talking about putting troops in the Donbass region to secure it. Yeah, because because um, I caught that because he now Ukraine was claiming there were Russians rolling across the border. But that doesn't seem to have been true at that time. Yeah. Um, yeah, because my understanding was so what he did was he. Uh, Putin, him being Putin, um, declared those regions, um, what do you call it? Like independent, independent republics. Yeah. Um, um, but because he didn't they declare ha- them independent well, republics. They declared themselves independent republics and he accepted. Well, he accepted. That. That's what, I, yeah, that's, I, that's more appropriate. That's what I meant, though. Mm-hmm. Is, yeah. Um, that happened Monday. Did it? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, and so basically he's sending people in to secure those areas. Mm hmm. That's my understanding. To protect them from the Ukrainian military. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a whole lot Which of Which they've been at war this. with for a while, right? 2014. The, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's yeah. not like there's been peace there and then Putin just rolled in. No, no, no. Not at all. Not at all. In fact, there's there's a lot of background to, to give on this. Yeah. Um, and I was already planning to give background on... The, the plan for tonight was going to be, um, we talk a little bit about Russia, Ukraine, and the background... Um, you know, like some of the history there. Uh, and then we spend most of the podcast talking about Canada and um, truckers and well, and truckers, but honk, honk. mostly about like the reaction to, uh, dissent in Canada. Yeah. Um, that got really quickly yeah. reversed. <laughs> and of course the first thing I have to say is, yeah, well I was wrong. 
Yeah. I mean, I you know, I kept saying that Putin wouldn't go into Ukraine um, because he had no interest. Now, I was starting to change my mind uh, over the last couple of days, especially after seeing clips uh, from his speech from Monday. Yeah. I, I read the speech, and the speech itself was, like, made you ask some questions, but then to see his... Um, Demeanor? Yeah, because um, yeah. he, he's always so calm, cool, and collected. Yeah. Um, and unemotional, like dispassionate when he speaks and, uh, he was not, um, this time. Like there was, to me, I don't speak Russian, obviously I, yeah. I'd already read the speech, so I knew what yeah. had been said, Yeah. but, um, you know, watching clips from it, he seemed frustrated. Yeah. Well, and you know, kind of emotional, like not, not real emotional because it's still Putin, but you yeah. know, like more emotional than, than yeah. you see for him, him a lot. Yeah. 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 Um, and so, uh, and the, the West became so intransigent about this whole thing. I started, I, I did start thinking like, we're not leaving this guy any options. Yeah. Um, and so, but anyway, I was wrong. I didn't think I didn't, I didn't expect this, but I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, like I had told you the other day, like they were beating the drums hard mm -hmm. in in the media. Yeah, like that. This is this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And mm -hmm. and and which is the reason well, I was hell, so surprised. The White House was already saying that it had happened. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I like what I was actually planning on starting with tonight is just pointing out how um, all the White House spokes liars the uh, Jen Psaki, Ned Price, John Kirby, and even uh, Kamala and Biden himself yeah. um, keep and have been for at least a month now yeah. um, saying if Russia, every time they talk about it, they say if Russia further invades Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Further invades Ukraine. Like they had already, like they, they'd done a partial invasion, yeah. um, but which isn't true at all, or it wasn't yeah. true at that time. There had been no invasion at all Yeah. Um, at that point. But they're, they're using this phrase, I can only assume, to uh, make it, make Russia the aggressor. Yeah, in all of this, and I, I have a real bone to pick with that because I don't think the Russia ha that Russia has been the aggressor in all of this. Yeah. I mean, even never minding the the fact of um, NATO expanding right up to the, their borders and uh, just all of the saber rattling and militant rhetoric directed at Russia, and you can't ignore NATO, of course, because NATO spends roughly a trillion dollars on on military um, every year. Who is it for? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, you yeah. know, the organization was formed to fight the Soviet Union or to be a bulwark against the Soviet Union. Yeah. The Soviet Union collapsed. It didn't go anywhere, and it expanded even further towards Russia. But it never invited Russia in. <laughs> and anyway, um, but even, like, just leaving all that aside for now, um, what I, you know, I watch European news, and I watch Russian news, or I watch... Russia Today, which is a, yeah. a state-run English language, you know, news yeah. outlet. Um, I watch France Twenty Four, and I watch some BBC and uh, Sky News, and so, you know, I mean, so like you I call pick them up all, stuff. yeah, the big um, ones, yeah. And what I can tell you is that well, you know, the the Western media was beating the war drum and talking about you know how they were going to put crippling sanctions on Russia if Russia dared to move into Ukraine and yeah. you know all that stuff that we've been hearing here for a long time. Um, what Russia was talking about is uh, that over the last like less than a week, I guess, or maybe roughly a week, um, they've had tens of thousands of refugees from the Donbass region uh, come into Russia. Oh, really? Yeah. So, and I would think that if there were tens of thousands of refugees fleeing the Donbass into uh, Western Ukraine, we would have heard that from the Western media. Yeah. Um, or, you know, Western Ukraine or surrounding European nations. Yeah. Um, we would have heard that from the Western media. But I didn't hear any of that. Mm -hmm. All I heard was the refugees are fleeing into Russia. Now, if we think about this, if you're talking about civilians fleeing a war zone, yeah. do you flee towards the aggressors or away from the aggressors? Yeah. Well, wow. <laughs> like if to me it's it says that if they're fleeing from the Donbass into Russia, yeah. they're fleeing to safety in Russia away from the Ukrainian aggressors that have driven them out. Yeah. Not the other way around. Yeah. Um 
So, and it certainly has been reported over and over that the Ukrainian military has stepped up artillery fire in the Donbass regions, and they've been attacking uh, both uh, militias in the Donbass, um, Russian separatist uh, yeah. militias in the Donbass, and civilians. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, even uh, the um, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, uh, put out a report saying that of the civilian casualties over the last several years in Ukraine, 80% of them were in the Donbass. Yeah. Um, that of the uh, um, military initiations, like the artillery fire and so forth, uh, artillery exchanges, that um, a vast majority of them, again, roughly 80%, I think, um, were initiated by the Ukraine side, not by the the Donbass side. Yeah. Um, so it seems that all along this has been uh, that Ukraine, the central government of Ukraine, the, the government in Kiev that we're trying so hard to support, mm -hmm. has been the aggressor against the people that don't want to be governed by them. Yeah. Well... And now we, we've come to this point. And um, to me, it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy in, in terms of like the, the U.S. media and government talking about that Russia was going to invade, Russia was going to invade, Russia was going to invade. At this point, I don't know that you can call it an invasion anyway. No. Um, it seemed to be pretty swift and very directed at um, eliminating Ukrainian military and protecting the Donbass. Yeah. Um, I don't think that Russia is going to occupy Kiev or, or even any area outside of the Donbass. Yeah. And I mean, we'll see if they do, then you can start calling it an invasion, I think. Yeah. But as of now, I don't see it as being much different than when they invaded Georgia years ago, um, when there were threats to their security on the Georgian border and uh, threats to Russians in Georgia, and they went in to protect those people and, and set up a peacekeeping force, which is what they're claiming they're doing now. Yeah, yeah, that's that was the claim I saw, that this was all the, you know, peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. um, and they're in a position to do it, I, I think. I, and <laughs> this is actually, so let me give some background and then, well... No, let me say this first, and then I'll get the background, I guess. Right. Um, I, I actually think that they could, they could make the argument um, that they are uh, trying, to, um, uh, trying to do their part um, to, um, uh, to support, maybe, to, uh, I don't know what the right word would be. Anyway, um, related to their responsibilities related to the Minsk Accords that were signed years ago, um, that had the long-term goal actually of uh, of reintegrating um, these two breakaway regions with Ukraine. Um, but it was the um, it was signed by Russia and Ukraine um, and uh, some European powers, and the idea was that it would be. And actually, Putin's been pushing this all the time. He's been talking about revisiting the Minsk agreements um, that included a, a ceasefire, uh, insurances of a ceasefire between, like within Ukraine, yeah. um, overseen by the, the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, um, and a level of autonomy for Donetsk and Luhansk, those two regions, but with the intent of reintegrating them as part of Ukraine. Yeah. And Russia is a part of this OS, uh, OSCE. Yeah. Um, and they were, you know, a part of what was supposed to be securing the, the peacefire or ensuring the, the ceasefire. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually think that they could make an argument that that's what they're doing. Yeah. And that they had determined at this point that the only way to ensure a ceasefire was to eliminate the Ukrainian military. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, I don't think that that's the argument they're going to try and make, but I, I actually don't think that that would be totally unfair. Yeah. Um, especially since they have been, um, you know, repeatedly attacked for not doing their part to uh, secure a ceasefire in Ukraine as part of these Minsk agreements. But yeah. nobody's really criticizing the Ukraine government for not giving uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, you know, some level of autonomy 
or leaving them be or their breaking of the ceasefire, which again, I said the, the, the OSCE estimates that roughly 80% of the artillery exchanges were initiated by the Ukraine side. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. um, well that, that would partly be because, I mean, I'm assuming because the Ukrainian government's the government we installed. Yes. So that's, I mean, that's got to be a factor in some of that. As it it far certainly as is. Anybody I mean, else speaking up against Ukraine? I mean, if 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 the Russia if Russia had installed a government in Ukraine and this mm -hmm. was all still going on the way it was, mm -hmm. there would be a lot more noise about that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, this is the uh, the government that was. Inst I mean, essentially, it's still the. Uh, pro-Western government that was installed by the U.S. after the coup, the coup in 2014, yeah. which is you know what that um, that call with uh, Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pia with the famous F the EU. Yeah. I mean, but the the bulk of that conversation is them discussing the upcoming coup and who they were going to put in power instead. And yeah. you know, lo and behold, Yatsenyuk, who they selected to be the prime minister, became the prime minister. And yeah. like there were all these people, and they were there's even <clears throat> and I, you know, I'm terrible with names, so I, I can't remember this guy's name, but there is a discussion of this one guy where they're like, well, I, you know, don't think that he should have, um, a, an official position. He should just be on the, on the outside, uh, you know, with the government. And the reason is cause that guy is like a, a known neo-Nazi, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? but they're still advocating for him to be involved, involved. Yeah, yeah. Just not an official part of the government. Cause it would be a bad it would look bad. Bad image, yeah. yeah. Um, Anybody that hadn't heard that call should go back and look, listen to it. So they played it almost, or uh, most of it, on No Agenda the yeah, other day. Yeah, I think they played, played the whole thing. It's like they, three and a half minutes or something. Yeah, they played. Um, yeah, I think they didn't because they said they were just going to play a little bit, and I think they played the whole thing. Yeah. But um, but yeah, so all of that's kind of fresh in my mind. It's the reason I kind of brought that up because mm -hmm. I had just heard that that clip, you know. Yeah. And, it's very telling, <laughs> and the and the whole F the EU thing is about the that the EU wasn't moving fast enough at overthrowing the Ukrainian government that existed at that time. Yeah, um, and so they were like, you know, we're just going to work around them. We can't wait on the EU to you know do whatever they're doing anymore. We'll just do it ourselves. Yeah, I mean that's really what the call was about. Yeah, um, and uh, and yeah, so you know if you look at it from the perspective of of these two regions and the Donbass. Um, they voted for Yanukovych. Overwhelmingly, these two regions voted for Yanukovych to be the the prime minister, or president, or whatever the lead title is yeah. um, of Ukraine. And then he was overthrown and replaced in this in this coup, uh, which was a, quite a violent coup, by the way. Yeah. Um, and uh, he was overthrown. And immediately after he was overthrown and replaced by this guy Yatsenyuk, um, these two regions said, uh, um, well, we don't want to be governed by, by them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and declared their independence at that time. Yeah. And I think that that's perfectly reasonable. It's like, well, I'm all for secession. So. Yeah, exactly. And then that's kind of, yeah, that's really the point. And in a lot of ways, this, there's, has a lot of parallels with the U S civil war. I mean, this is a civil war in Ukraine yeah. that we've gotten involved in for some reason. Yeah. Um, which is the point I'll always go back to. Like none of this provide, if, if we weren't trying to run an empire, none of this would matter to us. Yeah. Like this is all a world away from us. Yeah. <laughs> I, Ukraine security doesn't affect American security at all. And it's not like Russia is beaten on the doorstep of the U S yeah. Like the only reason that we get entangled in military, uh, militarily with Russia is by defending countries like Ukraine. Yeah. <laughs> for for no reason, yeah. no benefit to no us game. at all. Yeah. I mean, to us as as a whole, as a people. Now, I do have. There are a bunch of people that benefit, and I think that we should discuss that in a minute. But, yeah. um, you know, do a little bit more of this background. This whole thing could have been avoided, and um, and, and like I said, I, I think that the the U.S. was talking about it all this time. The U.S. media and the U.S. government was talking about this all this time. But this could easily have been avoided, like right up until yesterday. I think. Yeah. Um. By just listening. Yeah. And the, the problem is that um, that we've been condescending to Vladimir Putin this whole time. Yeah. Um, and, 
he wasn't asking for a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, he was asking for assurances that no offensive weapons would be uh, placed in Ukraine. He was asking for assurances that Ukraine would not be a part of NATO, um, yeah. that this NATO expansion would, would end. Yeah. Um, and the, the truth is that there's not really a plan to include Ukraine in NATO because it doesn't benefit anybody. Yeah. Um, and, well, and there are countries that wouldn't allow them in anyway. Exactly. And it requires a unanimous uh, invitation from the, the 30 existing um, NATO countries. Yeah. And I, j- I just can't imagine like Germany pledging to defend Ukraine against Russia with <laughs> no benefit to Germany whatsoever. Yeah. Because like Ukraine's uh, assistance, if German Germany needed defense, is essentially nil. Yeah, right. They're um, not exactly bringing a lot to the table. <laughs> yeah, and Germany has strong economic ties with Russia. Yeah. Uh, they they have some level of dependence on Russia for energy. Yeah. And it, there's no benefit to Germany whatsoever. I, I just don't... The only way that, that NATO invites Ukraine is if the U.S. bullies everybody into it, which is yeah. possible. Yeah. But unlikely. Yeah. Yeah, because you'd have a handful of Germany being one. I think France would be another, right? Probably. I that, mean, Spain. Yeah. I mean, like what would, what benefit does Portugal see out of yeah. this? You know. Anyway, um, yeah, I think that it would be unlikely. And the problem was that the U.S. just became intransigent about it because the because Russia asked for it. Yeah. And they yeah. didn't want to be seen as like letting that decision fall to Russia. Essentially, like you're not going to yeah. tell us what to do. You know, we yeah. have no intention of doing this, but you're not going to tell us not to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're just going to keep it on the table and yeah. you know it, essentially ignore um, the legitimate security concerns of Vladimir Putin. Yeah. And you know he keeps talking about uh, missile placements because while it's not likely that it would happen. Um, it has happened, however, in like Hungary and Poland and and so forth, uh, where the U.S. has placed anti-missile missiles. Yeah. Um. And the it's like the SM three anti-missile missile or something like that. Uh. Now the problem with those, um, is that they use the uh, the Mark forty one vertical launch system. Yeah. Uh, which can be refitted with the uh, thermonuclear tip Tomahawk missiles, <laughs> like fairly easily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the same launchers can be just refitted for for a thermonuclear offensive attack. Yeah. Just minutes essentially from Moscow if they're located in Ukraine, and yeah. that is a legitimate security concern for for Putin and I'm Russia. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Um. Just like it would be the same way if they were placing them in Cuba. Yeah. That would be a legitimate concern <laughs> for us. Yeah. And we nearly started a war over that you know 50 years ago exactly 60 years ago getting Actually, old <laughs> yeah um i mean you know or if they placed uh um you know if they replaced the regime in mexico with a pro-russian regime yeah and started putting missiles that they claimed were defensive, but could also be used for offense. Could easily be converted yeah. to offense. I mean, yeah. we would have to react, right? And yeah. the, the other thing that's very similar is that there are a lot of Russians, um, both ethnic Russians and Russian citizens, that and family of Russian citizens that live in this Donbass region. Yeah. Um, that have been oppressed and attacked by the Ukrainian government all this time. And if you want to use, you know, the same example again, it's like if there were a whole bunch of uh, of U.S. citizens and families of U.S. citizens living just across the border in Mexico, and the Mexican regime was oppressing them. Yeah. You know, how much outcry would be... And this is where Vladimir Putin's kind of stuck here. Yeah. How much outcry would there be in the U.S. that we need to do something to protect those people? To help them. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's the situation he's facing now. And he gave a lot of opportunities for a diplomatic resolution, and he was ignored yeah. or condescended to. Yeah. Um, and so you put Putin in this position where he, first off, he, he can't, he has an image and part of the reason that he's so popular in Russia. Um, and I think that this is actually a fair image of him is as a strong man. He yeah. can't appear to be a doormat to the West through all this. He can't appear to be a person who rolls over. Yeah. Um, so there's that kind of pressure on him. And I think that kind of pressure mostly comes from. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, comes from elites in Russia. 
Yeah. Um, it, but it, it comes from the grassroots as well. Yeah. And then the other part of that, the d- protecting Russian citizens in the Donbass, yeah. that's from the grassroots. Like that's yeah. the, you know, that's the people of Russia that are, that are putting pressure on him to protect his own people. Yeah. Uh, he's put in a really bad situation. He gave every opportunity for a diplomatic resolution. He was ignored. I, I think that we pushed him. Now, I didn't know where the line would be, but I certainly understand yeah. that that a line's been crossed, that he's like, I, okay, I've had enough of this. Yeah. And yeah. and that's the frustration that I think I saw from his speech on Monday, yeah. is him saying, look, like we've we've tried to play ball here. We've tried to be friendly with the West. And the truth is that Putin is actually a very kind of pro-Western leader in Russia. Yeah. Um, but he, he's been dismissed. Yeah. Yeah. What you gonna do? <laughs> you yeah. Know? So he was painted into a corner, and he had to yeah. do something. Yeah. Um. And uh, you know, I think that there's very little to be concerned about. I certainly hope. I mean, the concern is that there's some mistake that's going to happen. But I, I don't think that any of the Western countries really feel like getting involved in a real war with Russia over Ukraine. Well, I know that. A week or two ago, Biden really backed off that and pumped the brakes on that mm-hmm. uh, because there was talk of that for a while there. Yeah, I'm and hoping then, that this is an incursion, according to him. Yeah, and and he really pumped the brakes, and I do think he pumped the brakes as he as things looked like it was getting more serious, as as it has. So I don't know. There's there's well that to consider. And they were already putting sanctions on before. They were saying, we'll sanction you if you uh, enter Ukraine. And then they put sanctions on anyway. And, yeah. you know, um, I think that we, that we, like, that we poked the bear long enough yeah. that the bear finally reacted. Yeah. And um, I, I honestly, I don't think that it was unfair, Putin. I think it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that it was unfair. So what do you think this means for Nord Stream 2? Well, okay. Um, so we may as well get into the economic side of this. Yeah. Um, cause you have to ask, it's like, you know, the question becomes over and over again, like what advantage is this to the U S yeah. and the truth is like to you and me, it's not, yeah, this is a terrible plan. This is bad for us. This is going to drive up energy prices. You're going to end up with a volatile stock market and and possibly a recession, like if this continues. Oh, yeah. Um, You know, there's... And then, of course, there's also the possibility of, like, real kinetic war with Russia, um, which is bad for all of us. Like, there's no advantage to any of... to to normal people in the U.S. um, to this. However, um, let's try and follow a pathway here. Uh, there's actually been some benefit to Russia in this also yeah. um, because Russia is dependent on energy prices. Yeah. Uh, but the West knows that this is where I think the Nord Stream comes in. So okay. stay yeah. with you're, me. I will get there. You're getting there. I got you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm following um, you. Yeah. All right. So uh, Russia is dependent on energy prices. Like a, a significant portion of their national income comes from selling energy. Yeah. Right. Um, the U S and the UK have their, their fear mongering, um, over the last couple of months, uh, about a, a war, yeah. um, has driven up energy prices. This has been probably a, for a while. Yeah, yeah. This has probably been a net benefit for Russia up to this point. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course, uh, then you have Zelensky who is somebody's puppet. I'm not really sure. Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, who's yeah. somebody's puppet, yeah. um, has been advocating just recently um, for sanctioning Russia now. Don't wait for an invasion. Sanction yeah. Russia now, which we ended up doing anyway. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe we put him up to asking. That's, you know, to yeah. making that statement so that we would have, so we yeah, would, oh, yeah, okay, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll follow you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> Wasn't our idea. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, th- this whole time, uh, the U.S. had been advocating for the shutdown of the Russian gas pipelines. Um, and part of that, I think, is that, uh, that yeah, they see that Russia benefits from high energy prices. Mm-hmm. We don't want Russia to benefit from these high energy prices that we've caused through our fear-mongering about a war. Yeah. And so we, the, the added step is, like, now we have to shut down Russians, uh, Russia's ability to sell their energy. Yeah. At least in Europe. I mean, they yeah. then they just turn east to Asia. I I don't think that it solves everything, but <laughs> yeah. um 
but the point is like, you know, okay, so we're driving up the prices, but we don't want Russia to benefit so that we shut down their energy sales to Europe through these sanctions and shutting down the Nord Stream 2 and whatever else. Yeah. Um, but that then, of course, opens up the way uh, for the U.S. company, energy companies, um, to make up the difference and at the higher prices. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, meanwhile, like wealthy Americans can, and politically connected Americans uh, can benefit tremendously from stock market volatility. Like mm -hmm. if you have money to risk in the market, yeah. like a volatile market is the best place to is risk a, it. Is a place to play, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so you have all these speculators that are taking advantage of the volatility in the market that's being created. And especially if you know what's going to be said by, um, you know, President Biden or by John Kirby at the Pentagon the next day about how the Russians are going to evade at three o'clock tomorrow or whatever, <laughs> yeah. then you got a good idea of when you need to put your money in and when you need to pull your money out. Yeah. Um, so speaking of which, there's no rules saying these congressmen and people can't do that. Yeah, well, and you can't go look at the congressmen's, like, they're required to file these reports about their investments and so forth, but you can't go look at it. They're not public. Yeah, yeah. So you don't, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and uh, then, of course, like, you have the ever-present military-industrial complex that benefits oh, that from either wins. the threat yeah. of war or war. It doesn't matter yeah. either way to them. Yeah, um, they're still selling stuff. Yeah, and uh, just as, a, as an example of just government contractors making out on this kind of thing, um, think about uh, just a week or two weeks ago or whatever when the U.S. abandoned its embassy in Kiev to move farther west in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and they they didn't, like, pack up their stuff and leave. They destroyed all their equipment yeah. and yeah. left. Well, some mil some some government contractor out there is just rubbing his hands together, yeah. saying, "Oh, sweet, I get to refurbish an entire embassy's worth of infrastructure." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at taxpayer expense. Oh yeah. So there's a lot of people that's, that that's going to help the numbers this quarter. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people that benefit, just not the average American. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so there, you know, I, I'm not even sure what else to say about that. That's. Uh, it's the worst kind of cronyist, you know, corporatism. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it includes a whole lot of people dying, too. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, besides just being unethical and immoral and, and whatever else. Um, let's see, what am I missing on this? Uh, I'm sure that there's something else that I wanted to, to talk about. Um Oh yeah, and, and back to to Putin's um, diplomatic options that he 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 gave out there. He kept suggesting revisiting those Minsk agreements, um, but and and they did. Uh, you know, a couple of European nations, I think Germany and France, um, did initiate talks to try and and um, re-enter uh, or um, yeah, re-enter the Minsk Accords and and try and make that happen. Um, but the Ukrainian government refused to talk with any of the representatives of the separatist um, republics. Yeah. So they, they wouldn't allow, uh, like, you you can't reinstitute an agreement if you won't talk to the other side. <laughs> yeah, you know? right. So they refused to, to uh, enter any kind of negotiation with them. And so it was kind of, you know, dead on arrival. Yeah. And, uh, and now here we are. I think that we backed... We backed him into a corner where he didn't have any other options, and um, and the attack was was swift. It it targeted military infrastructure. Um, I, I think it's essentially over already. Yeah. You know, like Ukraine can't win. Yeah, they're not going to beat Russia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I, it, you know, Putin was forced to assert himself, and he showed, like, yeah, you still got to think about us. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Like, yeah. I mean, he told somebody. Um, or maybe one of his ambassadors, like I, I keep hearing this story from Scott Horton, but I can't remember the, the principles involved, but, um, that, uh, you know, either him or one of his ambassadors told, uh, a, a European official, he's like, you know, we could be in Kiev in two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think any, <laughs> and actually yeah. he was there in a day if he wanted to this time. So. Yeah. Well, and I don't, I don't know that anybody would really argue that. I mean, you can't really believe that the Ukrainian, w without support from somebody else, mm -hmm. the Ukrainian military is going to be able to stop the Russian military. Yeah. 
I mean, I just, I can't imagine that that would be the case. Yeah. And we're not really, like, even the U.S. isn't really in a position to, to defend Ukraine. Yeah. Well, that's just it. Yeah. And he knows that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So, um, and then, so from the, from the Donbass position, from these two republics, or these separatist Ukrainian provinces yeah. um, position, they, uh, going back to the, the coup, they selected a president that they wanted to represent them. That person was overthrown, replaced with somebody else who they didn't think would represent them, and they uh, announced a, a secession. Yeah. Um, and for whatever reason, the U.S. government is essentially on the side of the central government that wants to impose itself on people that don't want to be governed by it. Yeah. And this just seems terribly backward to me. <laughs> um, and yeah, like, it's not very you, American. <laughs> yeah. And if you, if you read uh, Putin's speech, he repeatedly talks about, you know, political self-determination. Yeah. Like these republics that if they want, if they don't want this government and they want this other government, they should be able to make that decision. Yeah. And I agree with him on that. Well, I, I wholeheartedly agree, but the U S government doesn't agree because yeah. they're afraid it will be a more pro Russian government. Yeah. And we just got rid of a pro Russian government yeah, in Ukraine. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so, but I keep thinking about Spooner. I, I, I keep thinking about Lysander Spooner and all of this, yeah. um, who was writing, uh, in the U S after the U S civil war. And he was a, a staunch abolitionist, but he was a very critical of the war. Yeah. Um, and he wrote this piece called No Treason. And uh, I lent my book with it in it to a friend, and he hasn't given it back. So um, I couldn't pull up the whole thing. Um, but I will try to summarize. All right. <laughs> um, and, I, and honestly, I bet you can find the whole thing online. Yeah. Um, it, it's not really that long. It's maybe a little technical. I mean, it's like a, it's a logic driven argument. Yeah. Um, but I, I think Spooner is kind of a fun writer. I, I, he actually, he's one of my favorite, you know, libertarian writers. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I'll, I'll try to summarize the argument. He's it, no treason is about whether the, the, um, Confederates committed treason against the U S government when they seceded. Yeah. Um, and he says, you know, the, the question of, of treason is separate from that of slavery. Yeah. Um, so, and the question of treason would be the same no matter which side had seceded from the other. Yeah. If the northern states had seceded from the southern states, it's the treason is, is of the same question as when the southern states did secede from the northern states. Yeah. Um, and his argument uh, is that uh, the, the principle at question is whether a government is right to impose itself on a people that don't want to be governed by that government. Yeah. Um, and he says, you know, if the principle through, through martial action, through the war, yeah. if the principle has been established that in fact a government does have the right to impose itself on a people that don't want to be governed by it, yeah. then the Civil War um, uh, greatly increased the number of slaves rather than diminishing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because um, a person subjected to a government that he does not want is a slave. Is a slave, yeah. Absolutely. And the, the difference between political slavery and shadow slavery is one of degree, not of kind. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that's what I keep thinking about here, is, is that honestly, the U.S. Yeah. should be on the side of these republics in the Donbass that yeah. don't want the government of central Ukraine that want to them. Concla to declare their independence. Yeah, they want their own governments. Yeah. And we should be on the side of those people to to voluntarily um, be a part of whatever government they want. Yeah. Or and that will take them because they actually said that they wanted to be a part of the Russian government but the Russian government didn't want them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, in 2015. And uh, you and you have that same question going on in Canada. Yeah. Really. Um, that, you know, you have a group of people that is opposed to the government or to what the government's doing to them. Um, and for whatever reason, we're on the side of breaking them up. And if you want to draw another parallel, by the way, um, 
when the uh, the people were out in uh, Maidan Square in 2014 protesting the government of Ukraine that we ended up helping overthrow, yeah. we were the U.S. government was adamant about you can't do anything about these people. You need to leave them where they are. They're <laughs> you know peacefully protesting, and you need to allow them to continue to peacefully protest. Yeah. But that is not what we said to the Canadian government. No, it's not. <laughs> but that was a different side of the political spectrum. And that's, I mean, that's really all there is to it. Like that's that's the well, difference. Well, the, the the irony there is that um, that we're claiming that they are the same side of the political spectrum. We're we're yeah. claiming that the the people that are protesting, or at least Canada is claiming that the people that are protesting there are a bunch of right wing Nazis. Yeah. But that's exactly the people that we were promoting protesting in Maidan in 2014. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> it, yeah. So, you know, the and the the question in Canada um like I I'm not sure what they're going to do, but what they have done, like I'm not sure what the people are going to do. Yeah. Um what the government has done ha- is that they have decided to uh economically sanction anybody involved. And they've also made the strange statement that if you decide to just like give up and go home, like you are now a criminal. And if you decide to give up and go home, you will still be chased down and prosecuted. Well, then there's no, no, there's no incentive, incentive for to me give to up stop. And go home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. And like if I'm a criminal either way, then I'm just going to stand here for my principal. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's an odd move for them. But, um, they have already like frozen people's bank accounts and so forth. They're, they they yeah. are literally trying to starve their own people that are dissenters against the government right now. And and that's a scary thing to start yeah. because at least to my knowledge, I don't know that. I mean, not on this level has anything like that been done. Mm-hmm. Not that I know of. I mean, maybe I'm wrong um, I, because I mean it's basically sanctions against individuals. Yeah. Without due process, by the yeah. way. Oh, well, yeah, that little bit too. Mm-hmm. And I don't know about Canadian law. I don't know if they've got like a constitution with rights and stuff like we do, but it doesn't matter. But either way, it's not right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that if America wants to promote democracy and the, the ideals of America that include protection of people's rights and liberties that that includes due process. Yeah. And that's a big one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a very important one that you don't want to throw out. Yeah. Um, it's kind of foundational, you know, beyond the ability to make your own choices about your life. Yeah. Um, and, and they're, you know, they're, they're trying to destroy these people's lives. Yeah. Um, really simply for, Standing up against the uh, against their government, protesting their government for being dissenters. Yeah, they're having their lives destroyed in, yeah. intentionally and and aggressively by their own government. Oh yeah, and um, and I think that the lesson here, you, you know, talking about secession is the is how important decentralization is because if you have a strongly centralized state, they can do things like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like if so. you concentrate, you know political, economic, um, and, uh, social influence in one place, then they can restrict all of these things. Yeah. And, um, and that, and that's a danger that we run into here. This is why we promote self-government so strongly is that, you know, a, a powerful central entity, um, can have a significant, significant impact on your life and you can't escape it. Yeah. Yeah. There's nowhere else to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's got to be a more upbeat way of <laughs> of ending. Um, well, um, I don't know if it's more upbeat, but there <laughs> is talk of um, truckers going to D.C. the next week or two here, yeah. sometime in March. Yeah, so, and they can face the same thing as the January 6th people, I was fixed right? to say, it's it, it does... I, I'd be interesting to see how it plays out mm-hmm. because... You can't really make an argument that the people are better in Canada now than they were before the truckers stormed in. I mean, I, I, I don't know no. how you, you can make that argument. I mean, now there's now the government has just taken more power and is exercising it against yeah. the people. Yeah. Well, but that's been exposed. It has been exposed, but it hasn't been put a stop to either. Well, um, um, it, it there's a breaking point. Yeah. Um, and I think that. I certainly hope yeah. that people both in Canada and in the United States 
recognize when their government has become authoritarian. Yeah. Uh, and now, I don't want that to be taken as I don't support the truckers because I do. Yeah. I'm just I'm just raising the question is did they really meet their goals mm -hmm. in what they were doing? Well, they just have to keep pushing. Yeah. I, I mean, that's that's the only answer. Like, the reaction from a central power like that is going to be to crack down even harder. Yeah. What you got to do is you just got to push through. If you want to put an end to it, you've yeah. got to keep pushing. Yeah. You have to win. Yeah. I, I mean, that's essentially what yeah. it is. And and winning is just getting enough people on your side. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. there's more of us than that's, there are of them. That's the battle, is is yeah. convincing people that you're on the right side of this. But they're, you know, they, the, the Canadian government is doing some very clever things in this regard. And hopefully, I mean, I mean my hope is that these things will create a, an even greater backlash and not succeed in making people stay home through yeah. fear of their government. Yeah. Um, but that's clearly the goal, especially things like um, threatening to take people's pets away, yeah. threatening to take people's kids away. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and that's that's a dangerous road for the government to go mm -hmm. down because both of those, particularly the kids, you're talking about the backlash from that can be more than the government mm -hmm. can withstand. Yeah, because well, that but will, their that hope will, is that that scares, that enough, scares people enough people to stay home. Well, that's the hope, but if that don't work, the backlash is is more than the government can withstand because yeah. there's so many people that that will hit too close to home for, mm -hmm. um, even if they don't agree with with what's with like with the truckers, for instance. Even mm -hmm. if they don't agree with what the truckers are doing, they're gonna be like, oh, I can't, we can't allow government to do this to anybody. Yeah, to take the take children away from people just because they're dissenters. Exactly. Exactly. So I mean, so you're right. I mean, the 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 trick is is you've got to you've got to have the people to overcome it. Mm -hmm. So and and I think that 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 particular tool can, can be one that helps the other side. <laughs> yeah. And the goal is just to decentralize power. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, that's what that's the fix to all of us. Mm -hmm. Like the whole reason everything we just talked about tonight is all like just government run amok. Mm -hmm. You start you start reeling, even if you don't completely go as far as we want to go with abolishing government completely, yeah. you just start rolling it back. Even the deal with Ukraine and with Russia, like you start rolling back our government, a lot of what's going on over there isn't as much of a problem anymore yeah. for them or us. Right. Both. Both sides would be better off mm -hmm. if, if we rolled our government back some. Yeah. So yeah, just something to think about. Yeah, we triggered these events by expanding NATO and not just taking it as a win at the end of the Cold War. Exactly. You know, like you can take this all the way back to oh, the yeah. 1990s yeah. of the U.S. poor foreign policy decisions triggering this string of events that has led us here right now. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. It's all right there. <laughs> so. Um, all right. Well, <laughs> I'm trying to think of some like really <laughs> positive way to end this. Yeah. Um, I tried. I mean, That's all I had. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that it is. So all of this, um, I, I was talking to my mom the other day and I think that, all, that all of this over these last couple of years, um, between the COVID stuff and the Russia stuff and the Ukraine stuff and the Syria stuff and the Iran stuff and the, mm -hmm. like, you know, all of these things that have been going on and how these lies have been exposed coming down from the top, um, mm -hmm. that the government's lying, that the media is lying, that the, the bulk of the power structure of America is just trying to manipulate you. Yeah. Um, and that, it, and, and at a time when you can get, information from other sources, even though they're trying to shut that down. Yeah. I mean, it goes both ways, actually. Like, it's both a blessing and a curse to have all this independent media available on the internet, people like us. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so you have people that are spreading misinformation, and you have people that are spreading the truth, but it's all available out there. Yeah. And if you're willing to do a little bit of research, you can you can suss out the truth of these things. Yeah. And um, I, I think that it's becoming more and more apparent that the independent media, the true independent media, um, has done a better job telling you the truth than the centralized, government-controlled, mainstream media. And a lot of people have recognized that yeah. and, and see that. And the more people that do see that, the less that 
they can they can hide behind the veil, mm -hmm. uh, if you will. Yeah, it, and I think that the great benefit is ours, is yeah. the libertarians. Absolutely. Um, and, and well, all because we're right about this stuff. Yeah, and the more people well, see that, that it's we're been right. exposed, that this yeah. is all a, a um, greedy power structure. Yeah, yeah. And we're the ones to take care of it. Yeah. Now. Convincing everybody that they're better off without uh, without a central government, that's still a, a you know, step away. Uh, you know, the hard part becomes like convincing people that they'd be better off um, by they wouldn't have to be responsible for things that were going on in Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, right. um, or Syria or Afghanistan or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, that they wouldn't have to worry long term about, uh, you know, the, fr the Fed overcreating money. Um, and, uh, and creating inflation and the government overspending and, and so forth. The, the hard part is telling them that that would be better um, when they also have to give up the things that they do get from government that they like. Yeah. And, uh, but what I always try and think of, and I, I challenge everybody out there to do this right now, is I, like I think about Harry Brown. That's not the part that I'm challenging you to th <laughs> think about. But um, one of the things that Harry Brown used to ask people all the time um, was, well, tell me one government program that they do well. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you which one that, that ain't. That stumps a lot of people. Yeah. It, I, I went to the DMV yesterday. Oh, yeah, well. It ain't the DMV. <laughs> no, it's definitely not the DMV. <laughs> um, but, I, I mean, that is a challenge to everybody. Yeah. Just name one one thing that the government is responsible for that they do well. Yeah. Yeah. That's a. F I mean, I can't give you one, but I'm, I can't either. Like I say, um, I may be a little more jaded than some of our listeners. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and if, if you come up with a good one, hey, email me, Michael at the Liberty Mike. Yeah, I, I, I will. I will happily um, concede. If no, <laughs> I will not happily concede. Huh? But uh, I, I accept the challenge to uh, explain to you why you're wrong. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but you would concede if someone had, if truly had one. Yeah, I, I would. Yeah. Um, you know, I, what I, what I suspect is that even if you come up with something that the government does reasonably well, um, that I could also easily explain to you why a private control of that would, would do, do even better. better. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that at the end of the day, that's, that's the big kicker is that even if you find something that the government does decent at mm -hmm. the private industry would, would stomp it <laughs> yeah. in, in a fair market. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, all right. Well, let's wrap up there. Uh, we may get another, um, another show out to you this weekend. Uh, that's the plan. Yeah. Um, so, Look out for that. It'll be off schedule, but it'll, yeah. Hopefully, we'll we'll succeed in doing that. <laughs> um, and Depends then hopefully, on how much of a party the Libertarian Party throws this week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, after we succeed at that, maybe we'll secede. Hey, and maybe. Uh, and that would be great too. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we'll be back, and if we miss that one, we'll of course be back in a week. We'll be back in a week either way. Either way. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and we'll be back in a week, maybe sooner. Yeah. And uh, in the meantime, follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe on Podbean, iTunes, YouTube. Uh, like and share. Tell your friends. Comment, etc. All of these things help. And uh, we'll be back in a week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm -hmm.